In the glimmering world of Hollywood's golden age, where dreams were spun on silver screens, one name shone brighter and more enduring than most, Judy Garland. But behind the dazzling smile and enchanting voice was a life marked by a symphony of drug use and malevolent forces surrounding her, a life that would become a poignant reflection of the complexities of fame, fortune, and the human spirit. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Judy Garland was born Frances Ethel Gum on June 10th, 1922. She was born to parents Frank and Ethel. They weren't a wealthy family by any stretch of the imagination, very standard middle class, but Ethel had big dreams. Her mom had taught her how to play the piano and sing. She didn't sing well, but she could play the piano and thus ended up with some pretty big dreams herself. And Frank was a friendly, fun-loving man from Tennessee who met Ethel while he was playing the piano for a local theatre house. Because of their performance background in common, Frank and Ethel decided to form what was known as the Vaudevillian Act, or Vaudevillain, I actually have no idea, which back in the day was a method of entertainment for the community. So when films just weren't as accessible or, you know, to be honest, pretty expensive to go to when they first came out, there was what was known as Vaudevillain Acts. So it was basically just a variety show, anything from comedy, singing, dancing, musicals, strongman impersonations, you name it. Like kind of think of just like a little circus act. Everyone had their own thing. And that's what a Vaudevillain Act was. So when Frances was born, her parents, Ethel and Frank, actually wanted a boy so desperately. They already had two girls that they were so sure that little Francis was going to be a boy, that when the announcement went out in the local newspaper, the paper actually said Francis Gum Jr., as in like named after her father, was born. And they actually had to correct it on the birth certificate as well. Now, Ethel, as I mentioned a second ago, she was a big dreamer. She wanted her name in the lights. She followed all of the gossip newspapers and articles and columnists of all of the Hollywood stars, music stars, you name it. Like she wanted to be a part of it. And so Frank and her scrambled all the money that they had to buy a local theatre house, like a movie house. And Ethel convinced Frank that what his movie house needed was a live performance on a Saturday afternoon. Now, at the time, child stars were all the rage in Hollywood, which is really weird to think about now because, like, we don't really care. They were the top build performers in some cases, like think Shirley Temple for some movies. And it's interesting to think of it that way, but I suppose it was at a time where they hadn't yet covered as much movie context as we had. So for them to have a genre of like child stars made sense for them because they were just making their way through the various storylines for movies. And, you know, we've kind of done most of them by now. So So because of this, she put her two eldest daughters uh, as part of this vaudeville act and she called them the Gum Sisters. Now, Gum, just for knowledge, was spelled G-U-M-M. We'll come back to that. They weren't anything special, but also it wasn't really their, like, dream. They were kind of just doing what their mum wanted them to do. But little baby Frances made her first appearance on stage one afternoon when she was being held by her grandmother in the crowd and she started to cry because she saw her sisters up on the stage and she was like, I want to be a part of that, please. And so her grandma, trying to kind of get her to shush, brought her up to the stage and just sat her on the edge of the stage, thinking that that would kind of like help her. You know, you're closer to your sisters, now shut up. But instead it just distracted people from the act because baby Frances was just kind of like giggling and she started mimicking her sisters, like doing little dance moves with her hands. And for some unknown reason, the crowd started to yell out, sing to this two-year-old, which is a pretty ambitious request, at least from where I'm sitting, but she did. She sung Jingle Bells because it was the only song she knew. This was the moment for Ethel, her mother, because she realised that she knew she had a happy baby. Frances was always giggling and, and she knew that whenever Frances laughed, she had this like booming laughter for like a two-year-old. But when she sung Jingle Bells so confidently on stage at like two years old, Ethel was like, holy fucking shit. She had the Simon Cowell look in her eyes and she was like, this is it. This is my ticket. 
So Ethel put baby Frances in the act. The two older sisters would go on first and then baby Frances would come out and do a number. She had a little belly dancing outfit that her mum had sewn for her and she'd come out and do a little belly dancing act and, you know, that's cute, whatever. But Ethel knew that this was her ticket to Hollywood. So it wasn't long before they sold the movie theatre, they sold the house and they packed all their bags and started moving west to Hollywood. And the idea was that they were going to try and take as many gigs as possible on their way to L.A., to Hollywood. And they did. They secured as many bookings as they possibly could. Like sometimes for just 50 cents a night, they would put the girls up on stage. And at least then they were somewhat getting paid and then getting closer to Hollywood. And after three long, awful months, they made it. Ethel was convinced that baby Frances was going to be the one that was going to make it big for the family. To quote Hedda Hopper, an old Hollywood gossip columnist, she once said, One look into the eyes of the mothers told you what was on their mind. If I can get this kid of mine on screen, we might just hit it big. They took little creatures scarcely old enough to stand or speak and drilled them to shuffle through a dance step or mumble a song. They robbed them of every phase of childhood to keep the waves in their hair, the pleats in their dress and pink polish on the nails. And that's exactly what Ethel did. She would style baby Frances's hair, even though it was was baby hair, like literal two-year-old baby hair, into these little curls. She would sew outfits for her. She would teach her how to make it look like she was about to cry, like quiver her lips and do like the sad puppy dog eyes. She taught her the chaplain stance and the chaplain walking movement just in case she got a role that required comedy. And before long, she basically had all her faith in little baby Frances. So she kind of left the two older sisters with Frank, the father, and her and baby hit the road. Now, this kind of sucked for baby um, because not only was she away from like the rest of her family, but from a very young age, baby had a really strong relationship with her father. It's mentioned in a couple of places that like the age gap between her and her sisters was just at that point where she was a bit too young to be a part of things. So she was kind of left alone a little bit of the time and that alone time she would spend with her father instead and and they just got along really well. So when she went out on the road with her mum, she just missed him a lot. And also to note, her dad, Frank, was gay, gay as they come, allegedly, and was a bit naughty with it. Apparently he would hit on, you know, young theatre boys at the movie houses that he worked at. But because of this, Frank and Ethel were just not on good terms and Frank was in and out of the picture a lot of the time. Now on to the name Gum, the Gum Sisters. This was the name of their act. So whenever they were billed outside a theatre, it would say the Gum Sisters, G-U-M-M. Now one day at the Oriental Theatre in Milwaukee, <laughs> I love the name of that town. What the fuck is that? It sounds like an animal. It sounds like a kind of elk. Oh, hey, look at that Milwaukee. That's a big one, eh? And I'm Canadian. Here we go. Anyway, So one night at this theatre, the Oriental Theatre in Milwaukee, they were billed as the Glum Sisters, G-L-U-M. And Ethel was so pissed off. She was talking to everyone at the theatre. She was like, hello, you've got to fucking change it. Like she was beside herself because she was like, that is not the name of my, my daughter's act. And the headlining act for this night that they were performing spoke to Ethel and he was like, well, when you think about it, Gum kind of sounds like dumb or bum and (laughs) Ethel was like oh okay that's actually a good point so they got brainstorming as to what they were going to rename the girls for their stage name now there's a couple of different stories as to why they changed it to Garland but this one makes the most sense to me so the night this happens there was a newspaper critic backstage named Robert Garland and Their name was suggested by this headliner as well. So Ethel was like, okay, yeah, Garland makes sense. Because also Garland was like, you know, a garland of flowers. Like, it's a nice name. And so the Garland sisters were born. At the same time, Frances hated being called Baby. She was a little older now and she was like, wanted to get away from that name completely. But also Frances wasn't really doing the trick for her either. One of her favorite songs was a Hoagie Carmichael song named Judy. And thus was born Miss Judy Garland. Actors live in a queer sort of world. Not many of us have the names or identities we were born with. I don't associate Frances Gum with me. She's a girl I can read about the way other people do. I, Judy Garland, was born when I was 12 years old. 
So one of the things that Ethel would do with the daughters was that while they would do school throughout the year, but throughout all of their holidays, like summer holidays, summer breaks, things like that, she would send them out to like a lodge and it would basically just be a performance the whole time. So one of the things she was booked for, the sisters rather, were for shows at the Lake Tahoe Calneva Lodge, Calneva Lodge, I don't know. They weren't much to write home about, but one day this guy named Al Rosen was staying at the lodge with a friend. He wasn't necessarily anything special, but he did have the makings to be a Hollywood agent and he knew talent when he saw it kind of thing. And he knew that Judy was the most talented of the bunch. But he also knew that as long as the two sisters and Ethel, no less, because she was fucking awful, were in tow, then there was going to be no success for Judy. So he had to kind of get them out of the way. He managed to get Judy to sing for him and a casting director at 20th Century Fox at the time. And after Judy sung for him, he gave him, he, he gave her his card. <laughs> Sorry. He gave him her card. He, fuck. He gave her his card and told her to tell her mother to call him. Oh my God, I should have written that sentence a lot better. You get the idea. She was told to give him a call. No, she was told to tell her mother to give him a call. <laughs> she got an agent. There you go. The funny thing about this arrangement is that Ethel was like heartbroken when she discovered that she wasn't going to be part of the deal. And so she hated Al Rosen for that. Like she and him didn't get along because he was the first person to be like, utterly candid with her and tell her that like she was nothing special and that drove Ethel mad so she hated Al and Al really didn't like her because he just saw her as this thing that was getting in the way of everything so <laughs> they didn't like each other but they both agreed and found a common ground in the fact that they both had this unwavering motivation to make Judy a star to quote Anne Edwards in Judy Garland's a biography First, she had been Ethel's dream. Now, she was an agent's meal ticket, his chance for the big time. She suffered severe and irreparable damage as a human being and as a woman, but these same malevolent forces became the prime movers of her career. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very proud privilege to present to you the Vice President of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, Mr. Louis B. Mayer, an All-American, in heart, in spirit, and in soul. cracking open a cold one. <laughs> Just kidding. It's 10 o'clock in the morning and this is Mount Franklin lightly sparkling passion fruit with a hint of natural flavor. How Judy first got scouted for MGM is a bit of a mixed bag. There's a couple of different stories, but one of them is that Al Rosen secured an audition with her with a subsidiary company owned by MGM. And he was just hoping to get her a recording contract as an artist because it was known to him and kind of everyone around that she was nothing special appearance-wise in comparison to what MGM had kind of built, but the girl could sing, and especially well for someone of her age. Now, Roger Edens, he was a top music executive for Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and he was allegedly asked by Louis B. Meyer, and yes, M Louis B. Meyer as in Metro Goldwyn Meyer, like his name's up there, he's the big boss, to have Judy sing for him to gouge whether or not she should be signed. Roger Edens got Judy to perform the same song three times and three different ways. He got her to switch it up each time, and by the end of it, he was sure. He was like, this girl's got it. She knows what she's doing. Eventually, there was a formal audition at the MGM offices in the studios. Louis Meyer himself came down. Hi, side note while I edit this, imagine me calling him Louis B. Meyer the entire time when his name was pronounced Louis Mayer. Sorry about that. <laughs> Forgive me. And listen to Judy sing. And apparently his facial expression did not change the entire fucking time. He didn't say anything. He didn't comment on anything. As soon as she was done, he just got up and left. And so they just spent the next weeks being like, oh, well, she wasn't lucky that time. Like, that's okay, we'll, we'll keep looking. Except two weeks later, Judy Garland was officially signed to Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Mayer was the wealthiest and most influential mogul in the industry at the time. He was the guy who had the chance to, with the snap of her fingers, make or completely break careers. He could blacklist people, but he could also put people at the top build spot of a movie 
and changed their life forever. But there was a problem for him with Judy because she was 13 years old when she was signed under contract to MGM, which meant that she was too old to play as a child star, but too young to play as an adult. She was also only four foot 11. So it put them in a really weird place because they were like, she's cute, but she's tiny. And then she's too old to play as these child stars, but too young. Like they had no idea really what to do with her at first. And just on her looks, um, it is funny to remember, like if you search up Judy Garland, it's really hard to think that she was viewed of as like not beautiful. Like she was viewed of as this like chubby little kid. And like, I, I can't, I shit you not, like I cannot find one photo of Judy Garland when I, where I'm like, oh yeah, she's fat. Like not even slightly. Like these days you wouldn't bat an eyelid. But these studio execs were like, no, <laughs> ugly. And she was kind of referred to as like this little ugly duckling. She went to school on the studio lots alongside people like Elizabeth Taylor and Lana Turner, who were some of the great beauties at the time. And she was constantly just sitting next to them, feeling inadequate and being told that she was inadequate by the studio execs. So you can imagine what that does to a 13 year old girl. Now, Maya was a, oh, a piece of work, like fucking piece of shit. Samuel Goldwyn, as in Metro Goldwyn Meyer, one of the other big execs at the company, said at his funeral that the only reason so many people showed up was to make sure that the son of a bitch was dead. Quote. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor once said in an interview that he was inhumane. He was like a monster. Now, a quick story about Elizabeth Taylor to give you an idea on what Meyer was like. When she was 13 years old, she was announced as a top billing cast member of a new musical film but Elizabeth Taylor wasn't a dancer nor a singer so her and her mum were like okay well we're probably gonna have to get you lessons or something and then get you up to scratch for this picture and so they arranged a meeting with Maya and basically just to ask him like hey w do you want us to organize it is the studio organizing it we just want to be prepared and apparently he just went off at them he was like allegedly frothing at the mouth with rage and was like, how fucking dare you come into my office and tell me how to run my business? You know fucking nothing. Get the fuck out. All because they asked whether or not she should go to a fucking jazz class. So Elizabeth and her mom were phoned later by the second vice president of the company and they were told like, okay, you have to go back to Meyer and you have to apologize to him because he's a psycho little man. But Elizabeth and her mom were like, no, fuck that. Because also Elizabeth's mum wasn't like psycho like Ethel was. Elizabeth had only started performing when she was like 10. So she'd had like a normal childhood and her mum had just kind of let her see this vision of like what she wanted to do as a kid. Like she wanted to try acting or whatever and she was beautiful. So it was a natural progression for her. But her mum wasn't psycho. So they were like, OK, the natural thing for us to do here is get the fuck out of this situation if they're going to treat us like shit. And luckily for Judy, she wasn't brought up with this same set of morals. Now, Judy was made very aware very quickly how much Maya's approval or disapproval of her could be detrimental to her career and just her overall sense of self. Except her mum was so psycho that she kind of would just like talk down on Maya as if he wasn't that big of a deal and needed Judy to see Ethel, her mother, as like this be all end all sense of approval and stuff. So Judy also had a father figure at home, Frank, who she loved and adored. So she didn't necessarily feel the need to latch onto Maya that early on. So when her father died unexpectedly from spinal meningitis and she didn't even get a chance to say goodbye because it happened so quickly, it fucking crushed her. She later said it was the most terrible thing that ever happened to me in my life. She spent eight days mourning the death of her father and you'd assume that that's appropriate as a 13-year-old girl. Alas, her mother was so worried that news of Judy's, uh, I don't know, sadness was going to get back to Maya and put her in a bad stance for like a role or something that she was trying to snap Judy out of it. But, you know... Because it's Judy Garland and she was taught for a very young age to just get on with it. <sighs> I can't even, like, we're not even into the story yet. And I'm already feeling melancholic about this. It was widely known that Maya was, mm, how do I put this, a fucking weirdo. Um, and he had a soft spot for, like, pretty young girls. 
but it got worse because he had this like really big god complex where he saw the girls that he had helped to start him as the most attractive to him. So if he had put you under his wing and helped you and signed you to MGM and you were, you know, a young Elizabeth Taylor or a young Judy Garland, he saw you as, you know, one of the more attractive ones, even though you were 13 years old. And he used to go up to Judy and say, you sing from the heart. And he would grope her left breast where her heart was and give it a good old grope and say, right here, Judy, you sing from the heart. And just grope the shit out of a 13-year-old girl. So gross. So since the death of Frank, Ethel now actually completely relied on Judy financially. And because she was a psychopathic, emotionally abusive mother, Ethel, grr, she would employ a new tactic whenever Judy was, I don't know, feeling tired or didn't want to work all the fucking time. And she'd just say to Judy, I'll tell Mr. Meyer. And then Judy would have to get up and get it done because otherwise her mum would fucking dob her in. So at the time, as well to note, there weren't any legal obligations to ensure that a child was paid for their work. Legally, they were owned by their parents. They were an entity of their parents and whatever money they earned was legally owned by their parents. It was just thought of as the morally right thing to do to set aside some of that money for the children when they grew up. So Ethel would get the checks and Judy was happy to sign them away because she didn't know any better. And none of that money ever was put aside for Judy. Now, in order for Judy to make some big money, she needed a big role. And so the directive came from Mr. Meyer to, quote, groom and slim that girl. She wasn't allowed to eat, I'm reminding you she's 13, anything but chicken soup. No matter what she ordered, no matter what she asked for, no matter how tired she was through exercise classes, dance classes, school sessions, and then just like test shoots and recording and learning lines and all of this, like literally the longest days for a 13-year-old girl, nothing but chicken soup. Sometimes she'd also get a side plate of lettuce. Lucky her. Judy said later in her life, Metro thought they were raising me. They were just dreadful. They ruled by fear. What better way to make young persons behave than to scare the hell out of them every day? And Maya referred to Judy as my little hunchback because she was four foot eleven and apparently had like a light curvature in her spine. Not that you'd ever fucking notice. But like it was just these little psycho tactics that were used to belittle her. And especially when a kid is at those formative years of working out who their sense of self is. Also... She would just be called into his office and like reprimanded and reminded not to cheat on her diet. And no matter what she did, like if she snuck out and went to the corner store to get herself like a cheeky little ice cream on a Friday afternoon, there were spies everywhere that would tell Mr. Meyer and then she'd get in trouble. So to prevent her from enjoying ice cream, Mr. Meyer put her in the hands of a doctor and the doctor was instructed to make her skinny. So she was prescribed Benzedrine, which is just basically fucking speed. And that was the diet pill at the time. And unfortunately, the side effects of Benzedrine was that because they were speed, they would keep you up at night. So naturally, the doctor had to prescribe her something for that too. Saconals at the age of 14. And Saconals, if you haven't worked out, are just very heavy sleeping pills. To quote Anne Edwards again, and probably not for the last time, Surviving on Maya's dictate of a chicken soup diet and diet pills, she was to faint several times from hunger. It was suggested she needed more sleep, but all the pills she took were uppers. A new system was inaugurated. Between setups and other performers' scenes, a time lag of about one to three hours, Judy would be taken to the studio hospital and be given a strong enough dosage of Nembutal to put her to sleep immediately. Fifteen minutes before she was to appear before the cameras, she was awakened fed a handful of uppers and sent back onto the stage. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Now, Arthur Freed was a film producer at MGM and he was itching to make his first film. He wanted something. And every time he asked Mr. Meyer, Mr. Meyer would be like, mm, no, maybe if you can get some property, which was just basically the term for like buy the rights to a film, then maybe. He said, once you've got a story, then maybe. 
Now, Freed knew that the film rights to the book, Wizard of Oz, were owned by Samuel Goldwyn, Goldwyn, Metro Goldwyn Meyer. But Goldwyn had been putting it on hold for a little bit of time. So Freed was like, okay, I'm going to try and get the rights to this film without Maya knowing, so that by the time Maya comes back from this trip to Europe, where he was just trying to scout as much European talent as he possibly could, Freed was like, I'm going to be able to present this. So he did some deals with Goldwyn and they signed the rights. So that would allow Arthur Freed to produce this film, finally get it out from under the table. And Freed had two things that he really wanted to do with Wizard of Oz. Firstly, he knew it would make for a potential great musical which at the time was the biggest form of film media back then. They fucking loved their musicals. Second, he wanted Judy Garland for Dorothy. So by the time this happened, Judy was 16. She'd been doing the run, doing little roles here and there. She hadn't had anything big yet. As a 16-year-old, she was maturing a bit more physically and she looked a lot older than the 11-year-old Dorothy in the book. So Maya initially just said absolutely no absolutely not vetoing Judy for this. He wanted Shirley Temple. And at the time they had this thing and it was kind of really gross. And I'll go into this in another episode where these contractual obligations meant that they could do a kind of loan between studios. So Shirley Temple was at Fox, but Maya knew that he could potentially loan Shirley Temple from Fox for this movie was a Voz. They asked to loan Shirley from Fox, but Fox said no. And the really cute story behind that, which we will go into in the Shirley Temple episode, which is absolutely going to happen. Apparently, she absolutely adored the Wizard of Oz book, but she'd been working as a child star for her whole life up until this point. And she was like, I don't want to be Dorothy. I just want to watch Dorothy. So that's why that never happened. So Judy Garland was going to be Dorothy Gale, but she was warned that she had to slim down quickly. She was to go into alternate days of fasting. She was given veneers. She had a new wig sewed on. She was hardly able to keep up with her like mandatory schooling in order to achieve her high school diploma. But like no one gave a fuck. So this teacher, Rose Carter, was assigned to Judy that every minute of the day in between little moments where they'd fix the lighting or fix her makeup or change something about the set, that is when the teacher would come on and try to teach Judy like, how, how are you meant to learn Pythagoras' theorem in those circumstances? I hardly learnt them in a traditional classroom. Now, the actress that played the Wicked Witch of the West, Maggie Hamilton, became a sort of ally to Judy on the set of The Wizard of Oz. And, like, this is a weird sentence to say because she didn't have many. It's really sad and shocking to hear that the four main male cast members, so, like, Tin Man, the Lion, the Scarecrow, am I missing one? They apparently played against her, even though she was a 16-year-old girl and just trying to make her way and being treated like shit. They played against her in the film instead of with, with her because they were worried she was going to upstage her. Not like the film was about her or anything, but I suppose, yeah, okay. So Maggie, because she was older, she'd been in the industry for a, a little longer, she became pretty worried about Judy and she noticed that Judy seemed to be ill sometimes, but she didn't know why. But she did hear a rumor about pills. So she asked Judy, she asked her about the truth about the pills. And, and she was like, why don't you refuse? Like, why are you taking them? To which Judy apparently just said, well, I just can't seem to go to sleep or wake up without them anymore. When Wizard of Oz wrapped, Judy was so excited because it also coincided with when she was going to graduate high school. Like they go to school on set, but then they're able to be assigned to like a specific school to go to to attend their graduation ceremony. And she was so excited for it. Like she showed Maggie her graduation dress and she was just so thrilled. But immediately after filming rap, she was sent on this huge press tour. She was pretty sad about it, but like didn't kick up a fuss because she was always told never to do that. But Maggie Hamilton, who, you know, wanted to go into bat for her, she called up the publicist company at MGM and was like, what the fuck is going on? Like, this isn't fair. She really wanted to do this. She offered to call someone, like anyone. She was like, is there anyone I can call to see if we can, like, make a, a tiny change to the scheduling and, and let this girl go to her graduation? But this publicist woman was like, I, I don't think there's anything you can do. These orders came direct from Mr. Meyer. Now, interestingly... 
the big song, Over the Rainbow, was initially cut from the film. Like, it was in the original cut, but when they were going through the final stages of editing and watching, they thought that it was too cheesy and sentimental, and they were like, okay, get that out of the film. But then just before release, they realised the first half of the film was just a little bit too low-paced, and it was technically a musical, so they were like, okay, uh, just put it back in, because they didn't have time to go back and re-record a new musical number. But it's just funny to think that, like, there's so many stories like that where, like, the biggest song of a movie or the biggest scene was almost never in it. Now it's time to cover some really shitty, gross stuff about The Wizard of Oz. Yay! Now, apparently the cast was, like, close to 9,000 because they needed a lot of little people. Um, I read that that's the most PC word to refer to them as. But I also like munchkins, what they were called in the movie. And to absolutely nobody's surprise, um, apparently the munchkins would grope Judy uh, just for fun. They thought it was like the funniest thing in the world to stick a hand under her dress and grope her. And they were all over 40. So that's cool. Uh, Judy was also one of the lowest paid main cast members of the film, second only to the dog. Toto made $125 per week. And after her cuts, Judy Cullen's made $250 a week for The Wizard of Oz. And then just to, to tie it up with a really nice, neat little bow, there's a scene where it snows um, and the, the substance of which this snow was made of was just just pure asbestos. Uh, they apparently tried other things, but asbestos was the only thing that looked best on camera. So there's that. Well, and whenever we do that little dance, up the yellow brick road. Yeah, I remember that. I was supposed to be with them. Yeah. You know. They crouch up. They'd shut me out. I, they'd close in, and the three of them, and I would be in back of them dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, and I, did, I wasn't, I wasn't good enough, you know, to say, wait a minute. Now, and so the director, Victor Fleming, was would say, hold it, you three dirty hands, let that little girl in there. <laughs> Wizard of Oz did exactly what MGM wanted it to do for Judy. She was now the top bankable actress in Hollywood. She won her only Academy Award for it. It was called the Academy Juvenile Award, and that didn't really last that long. So she is one of 12 people in history to have received that award. She was booked for a number of films after and worked to the absolute bone. And she was also surrounded by people at MGM that would just constantly tell her, like, if it wasn't for our vigilance, you would just be a fat, ugly teenager. They told her that, like, she wasn't really a good performer. They were just making her look like one. I, mm. Another note on her mum. For her work in The Wizard of Oz, she was allowed to have, like, this square of cement um, outside the Grauman's Chinese... Grauman's? Grauman's? Chinese theatre in L.A., Basically, they would just kind of like put their footsteps into this cement. But Judy did something that no one had done before. She knelt down and actually inscribed her name with her finger and then put a tiny, tiny little handprints in the cement. And her mum, Ethel, for some reason, just like went over her daughter's shoulders and straightened up a letter in her signature, which is just, oh, my God, that woman. She was kept away from men her own age, and I don't actually know why, but it's got to have something to do with the fact that they were probably going to manufacture her life, like marry her to whoever MGM needed her to be married to at the right time for the right reasons, like very Hollywood stuff that we still see today. But her self-confidence was just never given the chance to, ooh, I don't know, exist like, she was constantly surrounded by the most beautiful young women in Hollywood, but then she was constantly being told that, like, you're not like them. Like, don't get your hopes up. She was terrified of being seen. Like, she always thought people were watching her. And you've got to, I think, give some credit where credit is due here. She was probably had a reason for this, but just wasn't very candid openly about why, like, if there was a specific incident. But she would always get dressed in the bathroom with the door locked, she always thought people were watching her or had watched her in the nude, which, as I said a second ago, they probably were. She also insisted on wearing a slip under everything she wore, even if costuming said it wasn't necessary. She just did not want a chance of being seen naked. And I just, 
it, God, it just breaks my heart because we're not even really into the thick of it yet, you know? <laughs> but then Metro presented her with a new contract. For seven years, she was to be paid $2,000 a week for three years, $2,500 for the next two, then $3,000 for the last two years. A grand total of $680,000 for seven years of work. And take that to the bank and good luck buying a house in Sydney. And it just, you know, it just didn't get much better from here. In her dressing room at MGM, they had like a dress. I, I don't know if I understood this correctly, but from what I understand, there was like a dress for a really large overweight woman that was just permanently situated next to her mirror. And there was a note attached to it that said, do you want to be like this dummy or do you want to be a star? In her 18-hour days, she was forced to continue her chicken soup-only diet, pills every four hours, black coffee, and over 40 cigarettes a day. The studio liked her to maintain a weight of 98 pounds, or 44 kilograms. But this was the only life Judy knew. There were literally people hired at MGM to follow her around, and if she had anything in her hands that wasn't chicken soup, or if she had chicken soup when she wasn't supposed to be having chicken soup, they were instructed to, paid to, take it out of her hands. There were moments of happiness, and this next moment of happiness lasts all of about 15 seconds. She fell in love with a guy named David Rose, who was a musician, and on her 18th birthday, he proposed to her, but then she fell pregnant. She kept it to herself for several weeks because she was shooting uh, Babes on Broadway at the time. But she eventually told David and he was not at all pleased. So she tried her mum and went to mum with the good news of her new baby on the way. And Ethel just went straight to Arthur Freed and was like, what the fuck are we going to do? Ethel was angry and Arthur Freed was producing Babes on Broadway and couldn't lose his star. <sighs> After MGM meetings that Judy was not at all involved in, it was decided that she was going to have an abortion and... Due to where she was at in her timeline and also just state laws in California, abortion was illegal, so she had to do it under the table. They took her to a Hollywood hospital and the studio doctor actually performed it. The press were told that she just had a small tonsil flare-up and four days later she was back on set, back on the pills, back on the black coffee, black on the chicken soup diet, recording the musical numbers for Babes on Broadway. One of her biggest films was Meet Me in St. Louis and it was directed by Vincent Minnelli. The song... Um, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Sorry, if, <laughs> I can't help myself. If there's any Hollywood casting directors out there, I too am talented. Anyway, that song was in the film. It was the first time that she was allowed to be pretty, which was so cool. At least I hope it was for her, for a moment in those really horrible years where she was told she was like the ugliest person on the MGM lot. She had a complete makeover. They extended her eyebrows, they fixed her hairline, they removed the dental caps that they put on for Wizard of Oz, they adjusted her lip line, and for the first time she was portrayed as a Hollywood beauty. She ended up marrying Minnelli the year after the film came out, and their daughter Liza was born in 1946. Liza Minnelli. Her whole story to this point on, really echoes this sense of, of Judy just not having anyone in her corner. She was never allowed to flirt with the idea of, of her career being her own career. She was raised as a commodity and she was taught that to think for herself or defend herself would be selfish and not want her mother or anyone at MGM, like the people responsible for her career, as they would tell her, would want from her. Which explains, you know, why she was submissive in this sense. She was only 19 years old. When she tried to talk to her mum about her psychological health, Ethel would just go straight to Mr. Meyer. So she knew she couldn't talk to even her mum about her feelings in her brain that were no doubt being caused by this extraordinarily unhealthy dosage of uppers and downers constantly each day. Like there's studies proving what that does to your neurological health today. And to think that she was being doing that since she was 13 years old is... You can only imagine where she was at 19, only six years after it started. But she had no one in her corner and she was fucking broke, would you believe? Ethel remarried and her and her new husband basically just took Judy's earnings and would just put them through some of the shittest investments in history. 
they were always like, yeah, this is a sure thing. And then they'd lose all the money. Judy actually ended up losing her house because of failed mortgage repayments because the money was never being put aside for Judy, nor was she ever being put in a position where she could understand how her money was being spent. She kept taking the uppers, not because she needed to lose weight anymore. Shocker, she was just addicted now. She was actually becoming dr drastically underweight. That with the combined sleeping pills was just a really fucking vicious cycle. She was taking close to, if not more than, 40 uppers a day. Yep, letting that sink in for you. That's before you consider the sleeping pills she's also taking at night, the black coffee, the chicken soup diet. She couldn't deal with silence. The radio had to be on. She had to have conversation on around her. She was going through her first nervous breakdown and she had absolutely nobody to talk to. She actually begged Ethel to advocate for her to Maya to go to rehab, to just do like a little stint in rehab because she had heard of other stars going through something similar and and she knew that they were they were able to go to rehab and come back and feel a bit better. So she was like, can I, can I do that? And Maya was like, actually, I've got you a spot in a wartime musical. If you can imagine being anything else but an actress, what do you think you might want to have wanted to be? Happily married and a um, nice lady. Do you think it's possible to be an actress and be happily married? Well, I don't think any, uh, anybody who married me thought so, but I think it's possible. One of the many nervous breakdowns to come thus began the years of Judy just phoning people in the middle of the night just for someone to talk to. She was lonely. She would wander the house frightened of any noise. And one night she was using vodka at the same time as her sleeping pills to try and increase the speed at which they would kick in. And she lost count of how many she'd taken and she was nearing collapse. So she phoned her doctor and he came right away. And that's when they decided that she should probably see him morning and night just to check in to see how she was going. The studio, however, called it her first phony suicide attempt. When she married Vincent, who was the director of Meet Me in St. Louis, she had made 18 films in eight years. She was not in a good place. And yet she got through three full-scale musicals and the birth of her baby Liza in the first two years of marriage. The birth itself wasn't easy either, not that it ever necessarily is, but Liza was born by C-section and Judy lost a lot of blood and she was in a really bad place after the birth. She fell into a huge depression and she suffered a fear of any form of sexual activity for a really long time afterward. They did discuss retirement and that was something that she had said that she was <laughs> into the idea of, but she was signed on to so many projects that it was just like, no, <laughs> we don't have time for that. Vincent's career as a film producer was only getting bigger and he was very ambitious, so that only left Judy alone more. And if you're gathering so far, Judy was not someone who was able to be left alone. Like, considering where she had started at two years old and was in a vicious cycle of pills from the age of, like, 12, 13, she was a nervous wreck and completely anxious. So she ended up taking more pills. And the pill plan backfired on the studio like she was dramatically underweight she was going through a severe depression she had an endless supply of the pills from the studio because they didn't give a fuck they just get like she literally got pills from her studio masseuse i read she was still smoking four packs of cigarettes a day and she was dramatically underweight and now they were forcing her to gain weight because they were like you're too skinny to be on camera you look ugly but food was making her nauseous because of the prescription pills alcohol depression, overworked, like to the bone, an overall lack of any sense of support around her. She was completely weak, physically, emotionally, mentally. She'd start turning up late to set, tense, nauseous, unable to eat, anxious. She begged to be away from the cameras just for a little more time during the day so that she could be a mother for those hours and kind of remember that she has a daughter who she loved. She loved Liza. But the problem was is that because she had never been given a sense of self or courage or, you know, this is your career, this is your life, she was begging. She wasn't demanding. So the studio were just like, no, sorry. They groomed her into exactly what they needed her to be, which was just a little film servant. 
By 25, she finally made it to her first private sanitarium, and the studio assumed very wrongly that she just needed a couple weeks of rest and then she would be absolutely fine. Like, they had no idea how bad it was, and she still had access to all the pills. Why? Because everyone around her that was supposed to be her closest personal support system was also financially dependent on her. So while they cared about Judy, they also supported whatever means were necessary to get her back on the stage and keep the money coming in. And she wasn't the type to cry for help, despite what the media wrote about her. Like, they were vicious. They just did not have the right story, or they just didn't care. She spoke of that period saying she was just a mechanical hoop that they were rolling around. She would go days without sleep. The downers now were just, you know, throwing her into a deeper depression alongside any withdrawals she would get from periods without the uppers. She tried to speak to Maya, but she left the office in tears because he had basically reprimanded her and told her that she was just a little brat and was unable to control her bad habits or fix her pill problem. The same pill problem that he had personally pushed on her at 13 years of age. She was fired from a film and the media reported she was unreliable, temperamental and ungrateful. No media outlet ever mentioned that she might be unwell. There is so much of Judy's story that c cannot be whittled down into an episode of this podcast. Judy's life is one that is just so tragic. It was a constant cycle of being overworked, pills, depression, alcohol, flat broke so she had to continuously accept roles and the cycle would continue. At one point during one of the moments where she was institutionalized and they were trying to find ways to kind of make her better, she spent time in an institution for disabled children and she actually found it really rewarding and wholesome and she got to know these kids and would sing for them and she was able to survive, you know, days at a time without uppers. She seemed to be getting better. But when she came back to work, she was 15 pounds heavier. Oh, how very dare her. A whole seven kilos that probably didn't even make a fucking difference. But the cameras gave her an ultimatum. They were like, lose 15 pounds before filming begins. So she had no choice but to start the diet and pill regime again. But silly Judy only managed to lose seven pounds in the eight days before filming began. And the studio were pissed off with her. They called her ungrateful. Like one woman on set even said something like, I can't believe Judy just refuses to do what we tell her. <sighs> After 16 years, Judy Garland and MGM parted ways. Despite the $80 million that she made for the studio in her time, she was given no retirement pay, no severance pay, nor any residuals for the 28 films she had made for MGM during her time. Maya didn't even send her any condolences. Speaking to the press, Maya said, I couldn't have done more for her had she had been my own daughter. My dear! My high notes won't come out tonight. Over the rainbow! All right! In a couple of minutes, really. In the years following, Judy performed many times, except this time it wasn't so much in front of the camera as it was in front of a live audience, and it rekindled her love for people directly in front of her, giving her praise and telling her that she was not just enough, but like the coolest thing she, they had ever seen. Like the audience loved Judy, and it was for a reason. She was able to command the presence of a room with her voice and her talent and her charisma on stage in a way that no one else on the billing sheet could. She toured, she performed, she was just trying to make any form of money that was able to sustain her and Liza. Liza said to Time magazine, we started moving around a lot, usually in the night. That was probably because mama was broke and maybe she owed money to landlords. And she probably did. I alluded to this before, but the people that were in control of her money because it was never her, never paid her taxes. At one point, she owed upwards of $700,000 in back taxes to the government, and her possessions were getting constantly repossessed. Even family photos were being taken. She had a bout of really successful performances across London and New York, and for 19 weeks straight, she performed to packed houses full of people that just adored her. Her marriage with Vincent had broken down years before, but she was struggling to get a divorce from him. She met Sid Luft, 
who turned out to be again one of the great fuckwits, we'll get to him momentarily, her own mother sued her at one point, claiming non-support from her high-salaried daughter, in quotation marks for my audio friends. And Judy actually, in one of the only times she ever defended herself, claimed that her mum's claim that of non-support was kind of ridiculous because her mum was an accomplished piano player and could run a theatre house and was even a vocal coach as she had prepared Judy for the stage all those years ago. And so the case fell through, but then mother and daughter were just completely estranged. Ethel later spoke to a columnist saying, Judy has been selfish all her life. That's my fault. I made it too easy for her. She never said, I want to be kind or loved, only I want to be famous. The irony, obviously, here is, is that Judy had been financially supporting Ethel since the death of her father when she was 13 years old. And to make that point more poignant, <laughs> that's a fun sentence, she had only cut off financial support from her mother six months prior because she was so fucking broke she had nothing left. And Ethel was actually making more money than Judy was because she was getting money from these movie houses that she owned across various states with her husband and was also making money from the investments she had made with Judy's earnings. So, oh God. Just before Judy was about to give birth to her third child, the Academy Awards were coming up and she was once again nominated. Sid Luft, her husband, had gotten Judy and the hospital somehow to agree to have a camera crew in the delivery room literally hours after giving birth to her third child to be there to capture the moment where Judy's name was going to be read out as the winner of this Academy Award with her baby in arms. Except then Grace Kelly was announced as Best Actress for the award. And no one said anything. And within 10 minutes, the crew had left and everyone was gone. And Judy was once again alone in her room waiting for nurses to come in with her sleeping pills. She tried to divorce Sid Loft in 1958, but he actually filed a divorce complaint and then got a restraining order, which would prevent Judy from moving forward with any of her divorce action. He then badmouthed her publicly for her drug use and was trying to use that for his case and was suing Judy for 50% of everything she had ever made, claiming that it was marital community property. Divorce is weird. And remember when I said that Sid Luft was a fuckwit? So this was after they had technically like separated. But one day he presented Judy with this contract right as she was like on the way to one of her thousand engagements for that day. Because again, still overworked to the bone till her last days. He presents her with this contract called the Group 5 contract. And basically what he said to Judy was that it was essentially a trust fund that had tax benefits to it where a certain amount of her earnings would go to this trust fund for the five most important people in their lives. Judy, Liza, Sid, and the two children that Judy and Sid had had together. So the group five, her family. So of course she's like, yeah, that makes sense. I'll sign it. So she signs it and then runs off to the event she had to go to. What she didn't know was that the first 15 pages of that contract that she signed weren't put in front of her and neither were the names of the children on any part of that document. Group 5 was a con. Sid Luft got her to sign away her whole entertainment personality and image to Sid and these three other men that she had never met in her entire life and had no idea who they were to basically run her as a management operation and they would get every single cent and she was never paid a dime. There was also a really bizarre clause in it, which was so malicious in my eyes uh, and in anyone's eyes, if you've got any sense of empathy, that was directed at her like drug and alcohol abuse, basically saying that if she ever caused damages or loss of money to the company, this Group 5 contract, due to her not being able to perform, due to being collapsed or having an overdose or something like that, then she would be liable unless she gave 24 hours notice. Like, that is just fucking bizarre. <sighs> she wasn't healthy. She had liver and kidney disease. She was beginning to form a colon obstruction, no doubt, from the use of opiates and painkillers. She was plagued by anemia and her nervous system was in the toilet. During her final concert, she performed in Denmark. And like every other time before, she sat at the edge of the stage at the end of the set and sung over the rainbow as if she was still 16 years old. 
The Politec, a newspaper company in Denmark, wrote, It was as if she sang it for the first time in her life, innocent and sweet. Everybody in the theatre cried. At this point, she was newly married to a man named Mickey Deans. To note here, I did skip over her fourth husband. His name was Mark Heron and he beat her. So moving on. Mickey Deans and Judy were in London and they were preparing for her next set of engagements. And she was excited to move forward in her life and finally felt loved, she told people at one point. He said that they sat on the edge of the bed and spoke about it and were, and were thinking about what songs she was going to sing. She hadn't eaten, he said. When they went to bed, at some point during the night, Judy got up and went to the bathroom. And as she always does, she locked the door behind her for her privacy. But the next morning, Dean woke up with the phone constantly ringing and Judy wasn't in the bed. He went to check on Judy at the bathroom but got no answer and so he climbed up onto an area of the roof where it would give him access to be able to see into the bathroom window and he saw Judy sitting with her head collapsed into her chest and she had been dead for several hours. Some of the thousands of people who came today had been standing online for hours but they were quiet, orderly, respectful. They moved slowly into the funeral home and into the chapel where the body of Judy Garland lay in a glass top casket. After her death was announced, Liza said, I think she was just tired, like a flower that blooms and gives joy to the world, then wilts away. A white coffin was ordered for the funeral, but the funeral home said they didn't have white. And Kay Thompson, who was a vocal coach and a longtime uh, colleague of Judy's, just said in a very showbiz way, well... MGM would just paint it white. So just paint it. So they got a mahogany coffin and they spray painted it white and that is where Judy Garland was laid to rest. And that's where Judy's story ends. And I, oh man, I don't know what to say. Like when I was finishing off kind of the script for what I wanted to say in this episode and how it was going to be formatted, I was honestly just sad. Her story affected me more than I thought it would. Um, it's just so devastating and I don't have many words for it to be honest other than I'm so sorry Judy for what they did to you like it's just unbelievable the way that she was treated not only by the people that were closest to her but then by the media to paint her in such a way without knowing what the fuck was going on behind the scenes and that none of it was her fault she was hooked on literal speed and then sleeping pills to combat the effects of speed since she was 13 years old. And yet she was painted as this unreliable brat. And it, it is just so contrary to the truth. It just puts it in perspective for where we're at today in terms of the media is no different. We talk about people like celebrities as if we know everything that's going on. And a lot of celebrities get a hard time for similar things that Judy is, was accused of, of being, you know, ungrateful and whatnot. I think it just puts it in perspective that we should shut the fuck up unless we actually know what's going on and to give people a fucking break because we're all human. Thank you for listening to this episode. I am so sorry to have ruined your day. <laughs> um, I hope it doesn't put a little melancholic spin on the rest of your day, but I, I, I struggle to understand how it wouldn't. If you're watching on video, please give this video a thumbs up. Or if you fucking hated it, a thumbs down. That button is there as well. I, um, I do try to accept any form of feedback. So yeah, test it out if you want. <laughs> and if you're on audio, a podcast review on your app of choice would be much appreciated. But other than that, I will see you guys next time. <laughs>